I'm going to uh, take an overall, a much wider look and just explain why we have prairie here in Texas, um, kind of what they're all about. So We're having a little bit of problem with the, the screen, so Debbie's just trying to fix that. We have ancient um, technology here. I can also talk to you about the world. Can we just, you can just what, <laughs> what's wrong with it? Is there, it looks fine to me. It's got the line at the bottom of it. I, I don't know. Yeah, just grab that thing and tilt it down. Or, uh, it's not a good idea. Does this change the slides? <coughs> so it's too it's too big. Is there any way to? It's showing the beginning of the next slide, I think. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll let Debbie figure that out, and um. Uh, so <clears throat> it's very important to understand why prairies are the way they are why why they exist where they exist why they don't exist where they don't exist why they look the way that they do um, it's not an easy question to answer and it's not an easy question to know whether or not that's an important question to ask uh, people have been thinking about this a lot um, since they first recognized prairie as an ecosystem rather than just as, a, as an area that wasn't good enough to grow trees. Um, so uh, there's a really good book um, about grasslands in the south and when we, we don't just talk about prairies, we talk about grasslands. Grasslands include things like prairies which are just largely open grass without trees. They talk about uh, savannas, which are mixtures of trees and grass together, um, where the trees aren't dense enough to, sh to shade out the understory of grasses. We talk about woodlands, which is where you have maybe a little bit denser of a tree cover, but you still have a lot of grasses and flowers down beneath. Um, so when I so this talk today is really not just restricted to just prairie, but more more grasslands in general. Um, but in this book, uh, Reed Noss uh, says to conserve wild things and their habitats, we must know and understand how they live and interact. It's very important to know what prairies are and what created them in order to maintain them. Uh, and again, uh, poor training in natural history leads to second-rate conservation. So there's nothing that causes me to cringe more than to have uh, A naturalist come on the television and explain things to people about our natural world that are incorrect and lead them to think that uh, perhaps the management technique is, is a good thing um, but just leads to disaster. Uh, probably the most common one that, I, that really gets on me is where you have conservationists going out and planting trees and prairies thinking that hey, here's an area without trees let's get some growing here. Um, I had a nightmare, and I'll tell you this. <laughs> I told Wendy this. Wendy's and I are married, by the way. Get that out of the way. <laughs> I wonder why she's smiling at me so much. I like she introduced you, Mr. Andrew. Yeah, I like you. <laughs> so, uh, so I was asleep on the floor and, uh, with the dog laying on me, and you know, they come in all wet and covered in sand and dirt, and they're just, they just, what do they do? You're laying on the couch, and they just jump up there with you and lay right on top of your face. And uh, so I woke, the dog woke me up, and, uh, and I realized that I uh, look out the back window, and uh, for whatever reason, I'm sleeping at the office there at the Galveston Island State Park, and the entire prairie is just a sea of flames that's on fire. And so I tell the manager, I'm like, Hans, the prairie's on fire. He's like, I know, I already called the fire department. And I look out the window again, and it's all been put out. The entire prairie is burned black, and the fire department's out there. And um, they're, uh, they're like, yeah, the area burned down. We're going to um, make sure we get all the fire out. So they're actually running a plow over the prairie. They're plowing the entire park up to uh, make sure they got all the embers out. And I run out there yelling at them, what the heck are you doing? You know, stop, please stop. And, and then here's these dump trucks uh, dumping like 
blocks of cement. And I'm like, well, it's already been ruined, so we're just going to get rid of this garbage we had laying around the city. And then here comes this Boy Scout troop, and they're dressed in like 1950s clothing with the shorts and the smoky bear hats, and they're we're going around. They're planting rows and rows of trees to restore the whole park. And I wake up, thank goodness. <laughs> It was just a nightmare, but for a prairie conservationist, that is like, in a nutshell, our, our biggest nightmare is right there. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let's talk about prairies. Let's talk about ecology. This ecology is a study in, of the distribution and abundance of living things. And conservation biology specifically asks, why do they live where they live, and what's necessary for their continued survival of these natural systems? Um, this is just a quick a little photo of uh, Sheldon Lake State Park, um, which is a pretty decent prairie, but uh, not too many years before this picture was taken, this was being farmed for uh, corn and sorghum and rice. So uh, if you understand an ecosystem well enough or a prairie well enough, you can do a fairly good job of restoration. And that's kind of what my job is all about. Um, a lot of the state parks, they weren't set aside because they're preserving outstanding natural areas. They were set aside because it was somebody's farm or ranch uh, that the governor knew and, and got him to donate it into the public domain. So a lot of our parks need um, are not in their natural state. And one of my big jobs is to try to um, restore them to a, to a natural landscape. So let's talk about grasslands, and Jaime has a much better picture of grasslands in Texas than me. I had to scour a few books to get these, and uh, <clears throat> they're not at all complete. But if you look at North America, we've got grasslands that stretch. We've got the Palouse Prairies in Washington and Oregon. We've got the uh, short grass, mixed grass, which just really refers to the height of the grasses, short grass in the drier areas, mixed grass in the moderately wet areas and then tall grass in the eastern areas which receive plenty of rainfall. These prairies step, stretch across the continent. We have desert grasslands. We have the coastal prairie. And what's missing from that, however, is all of this stuff along the east coast, Louisiana, Florida, up to the Carolinas, Virginia, and even New Jersey. These are grasslands as well. Um, we have the Everglades, which is essentially a grassland. We have all of the uh, pine savannas. So much of the uh, coastal plain of the Atlantic and Gulf Coasts were once dominated by what some people considered pine forest or a mixed pine oak forest, but in reality, the uh, vast majority of the species were grassland species, grasses and flowers with some trees overhead. So these are these are grassland communities as well. What's not shown on here is there is an arc of clay soil through Mississippi and Alabama, uh, old limestone weathered limestone uh, and the resulting clay soil grew grasses. So we actually had an arc of grasses here as well as the bluegrass areas in Kentucky. Again, that's because of the soil type that existed there. Uh, and there of course, these grass, <coughs> grasslands actually extended into uh, Ohio and even uh, areas where you had like deep sand, <coughs> Cape Cod, Massachusetts, those were, were grasslands all the way in Massachusetts. Um, that's why we had the heath hen, which is just another version of the greater prairie chicken out of Navajo State. <coughs> and uh, as we've studied fossil evidence over time, both the fossils of grassland living herbivores, as well as um, preserved pollen samples and preserved um, plant samples as fossils or otherwise preserved. We've come to realize that a lot of these grasslands in our area and throughout the south, southern U.S. are ancient. Um, these are systems that developed as, as the climate changed, as the uh, lands emerged, as the seas receded from uh, what's now uh, the Mississippi Valley and portions along the Gulf Coast. Uh, we had the migration of western species from drier areas into the southeast. This occurred starting about 40 million years ago. Um, evidence today that our grasslands are not just something newly developed is the presence of endemic species, species that um, 
through fossil evidence we know have evolved over long periods of time in this particular region. Uh, so grasslands have been here a long time. Um, <coughs> it had been debated at one point that perhaps these are just something that were human created when Native Americans came <coughs> to North America 20,000 or so years ago and they started lighting things on fire that uh, Western species that lived in uh, drier areas were able to move into the eastern U.S. But uh, as time has gone on, um, scientific research has shown that that's not really the case. Uh, uh, Dr. Noss argues in his book and in presentations that he gives that um, if you look at many grasslands in the south, uh, uh, lightning, they actually more occur where we have frequent lightning. You can overlay a map of uh, lightning frequency in grasslands and they line up fairly well. Uh, an area that he works at in Florida says, he states that if people weren't putting out the fires, essentially they'd be annual burns just, just from natural cause lightning fires. Uh, that's not true for all grasslands and especially as you move up into areas in the Midwestern U.S. and um, uh, East Texas, North Texas, um, if, you, if we look at uh, past fire history by looking at scars on old tree trunks, uh, most of those fires were lit during the cool season um, by Native Americans. So I'm not going to say that's not important, but essentially uh, grasslands are where they are. They've been where they, they have been, they've been where they're at now for a very long time, long before people came on the scene. Uh, <coughs> When I started out in this uh, business, I had frequently read that uh, our prairies are only about 10,000 years old and they formed after the last ice age. And that um, each time we would have an ice age, which there's been about, I think, 42 of them in the last 3 million years or so. Um, each time the ice receded and the climate warmed, that whatever species would just assemble themselves into uh, a random ecosystem and uh, each, each time we had a we went through one of these climatic disruptions and the climate warmed again that the ecosystem that resulted may not have at all looked like the one that was there before but what we're finding out is that that's not really true you can't just um, take all these species that occur in, in the southeast and throw them up into the air and let them fall back down onto the ground and they'll assemble themselves into, into some kind of orders, almost as if they just get pulled back down to the earth by gravity and there they are. Uh, what we're finding out is that these species have co-evolved over millions of years and that these ecosystems are actually very um, finely functioning uh, systems where uh, the various parts have evolved with one another over millions of years and that uh, in order to conserve this system, we need to conserve all the parts. Uh, one of the uh, great ecologists, uh, Aldo Leopold, said that uh, um, the first rule of intelligent tinkering is to save all the parts. You don't take your car apart, you know, your engine apart, and when you're left over, if you got a box of parts left over, it's probably not going to start. You know. Uh, <coughs> so. If you wonder why you go out on a prairie walk and uh, a botanist is all excited about all these tiny little plants, it's because those are parts of the prairie, all those different parts are important. So our, our prairies have a very long uh, history and um, that history is important in understanding them and maintaining them. I show these two communities because these two examples of prairie, this is on top of uh, what's commonly called a bald. This is a sandstone glade up on top of a salt dome at uh, Davis Hill State Natural Area. Um, sits about 250 feet up above the Trinity River on top of a salt dome, which is just where a huge block of salt over millions of years has uh, been lifted up through the Earth's crust and his uh, pulled up the overlying sandstone and limestone with it and you end up with this essentially what people around here would call a mountain where you have bare rock exposed at the top of it and um, because of that 
and get uh, grasses instead of trees. So you had this, at Davisville, we had this beautiful grassland community. And you look down the hill a couple hundred feet, and down there is just all bald cypress swamp. It's really a neat area. And here's an area at the Fort Boggy State Park up I-45 north of Madisonville, where we have deep, deep sands that have been eroded out of uh, I think Miocene deposits. And uh, you have these just beautiful um, flower-dominated uh, grasslands <coughs> in areas that are otherwise largely forest. And the, would uh, would you say that Fort Boggy is a good place to see post oak savanna? Oh yeah, it's about the, one of the best I think. It's got it's an ancient, ancient um, post oak forest on it. So you'll if you go there, you'll see a lot of tiny little post oaks. Those post oaks could be a couple hundred years old. Those are sand post oaks, not not the typical post oak. It's Quercus margareta. It's a different species that's adapted to very deep sands. Who's this? <coughs> it's north of Madisonville. I-45 actually cuts the park in, in two. It's it's at the town of Leona, the hometown of which famous blues musician? Oh, Albert Collins. Oh. <laughs> Very wicked guitar player. It's just. I got a little statue of him there. <laughs> Is it open to the public? Yeah, it's open to the public. Uh, had been open only on the weekends because of the lack of staff. I'm not sure what their hours are, but if you go to the website, you'll be able to figure it out. Um, there's not a lot of hiking trails, but just get out there and just start walking on the old branch roads and you'll see some really cool stuff. It's one of my favorite parks. So uh, if we look at grasslands, uh, it's pretty easy to figure out that grasslands, especially in the southern portion of the U.S., it's not because these areas don't get much rainfall. So if you look at even a recent 1991 um, book, Ecosystems of the World, it says grasslands occur where there's too much rain for desert but not enough for forest. Well, that just erase that from your head because it's incorrect. <laughs> Um, we do have grasslands where the climate is dry, such as the western U.S. and the desert southwest, because grasses are very well adapted <coughs> to um, handle, uh, they can survive on very little rainfall, or they can survive in areas that are inundated for a couple months at a time. But this is taken to the extreme in areas like the Llanos and Venezuela, where you can have 10 feet of water, covering the land surface, electric eels, stuff swimming around, um, fish, huge giant fish swimming around one season, and the next season it's like dry as a bone, the ground is just like hard as a brick, you can't hardly dig into it with a shovel. Out of those extreme fluctuations of moisture, trees do not do very well. The grasses can flourish. So you have grasslands along the Amazon River that are seasonally flooded maybe 40 feet in depth. And likewise, in the southeastern U.S., where we have a very hot climate, the ground can dry out and be extremely hard, or it can be underwater. And uh, those are the sorts of conditions that grasses flourish in. And also, in the southeast, you have areas with very deep sands, um, often uh, nutrient poor. And in situations like that, you have grasslands as well. And then there are some really cool areas, outcrops of sandstone and limestone, uh, they're often called glades or bulbs or barrens, and you have grasslands in those areas as well. So there's a lot, a lot of reasons that we have grasslands, but some of the some commonalities are that grasslands are chiefly found where there are dry seasons or occasional, occasional short periods of dry weather during which the ground cover dries out and where the land surface is smooth to rolling, and that's important because a smooth rolling land surface allows fires to travel across it areas without a lot of natural fire breaks. Um, that was figured out by some guy in 1950. So, uh, <clears throat> one thing that's difficult for me, and gets harder and harder for people as time goes on, is that as, as our natural communities are frayed and become, the areas that are really in their natural condition become rarer and rarer, the next crop of biologists are gonna have a harder and harder time understanding what makes the world tick. It's, it's something that disappoints me that I 
couldn't see the world the way it looked in 100 years ago, and I'm sure that uh, my children will never really have the, quite the understanding of our natural world that I have. It's just not going to be possible uh, because there's so little of the natural world left. Yes. Yeah, I'm wondering how about the role of wind pollination and topography. Is that a kind of unifying common thing uh, of um, lands, regardless of moisture? I don't know an answer to that question. I do know that as grasslands become fragmented, that pollination becomes a real problem and that species will go extinct because of lack of pollination. Because just the, you don't have a large enough area to maintain a pollinator population. A good example of that in our region right here are yuccas. Yuccas all require a specific moth to pollinate them. And if you don't have enough yuccas in an area, then you don't have the moths and there's no pollination. So we have yuccas, say, Galveston Island State Park, and we don't have yucca moths there. Um, we have yuccas at, at Davis Hill, uh, other parks and, and there's no pollination going on it's just the persistence of, of a perennial plant so essentially they're living they're dead already they just you know they haven't gotten there yet uh, of course there's things you can do like introduce you can hand pollinate plants or introduce pollinators but I don't I don't really know an answer to that question I'm there's probably a uh, a, a minimum size of <coughs> a pollinated pollinator dependent grasslands just because of that. The other thing I was going to point out is that uh, this is this shows a map of these of uh, gumbo clay soils or these soils that Mark showed where when they dry out you can put your hand down into these cracks um, and you see that uh, a lot of our Texas coast where we have this coastal prairie is dominated by these clay soils or gumbo soils That's why we, down here we have a lot of problems home foundations. I also see this arc of these soils here through Mississippi and Alabama, which is also an area of Blackland Prairie, and then up here around Dallas. Again, eroded Cretaceous limestones, which created these clays, and that's the home of the Blackland Prairie in Texas. So, uh, abundant lightning, prolonged warm seasons with drought, uh, funky soils that trees don't like, uh, vegetation that evolved with fire, all those result in grasslands. And here's a very important thing to understand is that grasses are very good competitors for moisture and nutrients. And you can take a tree and you can plant it in the prairie and that tree is going to do great. But if that tree were to drop acorns or whatever out onto the prairie, it's very unlikely that those young would survive just because the it's the it's the the seedling stage of trees and brush it's those seedlings that have to compete with established grasses in order to get going and they don't normally make it um, so if you have uh, uh, intense competition between woody seedlings and the grasses and flowers and it's very rare that the woody seedlings succeed <coughs> and they finally get growing and then a fire comes along and burns them up you know the result is that you've got a, a grassland ecosystem now you go in and overgraze it as mark was saying you put up a fence around the prairie and graze it and you remove those grasses even if it's just a temporary temporary reduction it's enough to get to allow woody species to get going so typically what we'll see around here is you can graze a prairie down and as long as those cattle are really beating the ground down and eating everything, it seems like, oh yeah, the cattle are maintaining this open grassland. And it's, the day you take the cattle off, all the woody trees and brush grow up thick because the grasses have been removed. Of course, the rancher will tell you it's because that took the cows off. The cows were good and what made the prairie survive. Uh, but it's, it's the lack of competition that oftentimes will do in a uh, will allow a prairie to very quickly secede to uh, to a woody state. So there, like Mark was saying, there's some prairies that have been 50 years without a fire or anything, and they look great. Well, those are prairies that are very much intact, um, and it's very rare. Uh, but for the most part, you've got to uh, do some sort of disturbance, usually fire or haying or mowing. Um, in order to maintain a prairie. Uh, and in the long run, you've got to have disturbance like uh, essentially that imitates grazing. 
in order to maintain all of the floral diversity in the prairie. So some of the best prairies we, we have left are areas that have been hay meadows. And a hay meadow is where you cut the grass once or twice a year, usually two, maybe three times a year. And then you take that grass up and you bale it up into hay. And by removing that thatch, you're leaving nice open areas of ground. And that allows a lot of especially annual flowers, which the, the seeds drop every year and create the this next generation. Those things need to drop onto bare soil in order to germinate. They need some room to germinate. And uh, haying allows that to occur. But that's, haying is probably the best imitation we have of, uh, of what bison used to do is they uh, graze across the landscape. Now you can do it with cattle. Um, they, they work fairly well, I think, at the Atwater Prairie Chicken Refuge. But in order to really work with cattle, you've got to have 20,000, 30,000 acres, or else it's really difficult. Is it because they have to move from one place to another? because they got to move from one place to another. And as Mark would say, rancher does not want to move his cattle. You're running the fat off of them, is what he'll tell you. You got to maintain all that fence. Yeah, it's just hard. The big area gives you an adequate rest period, too. Yeah. You talked about the time the prairies need to recover after intensive grazing. What happened at our place in that small plot? We rotated them around in all those different management units that you saw the map of, but the grass has never recovered to their full height. So essentially most of our prairie look as if it had short grass that had recently been grazed. A big area, and you've described in 20, 30,000 areas, you got lots of room to let big parcels rest for that time period. So it's so managing these grasslands in kind of our artificial environment is very, very difficult to do. It's very difficult to maintain entire complement of plants and insects and all. Uh, not just because of the small size, but because these um, factors which maintain grasslands usually operate on a very large scale. Uh, uh, another problem is invasive species, as Mark said. Probably one of the most endangered grassland types is the disturbed um, I guess you could call it early secessional. Are y'all familiar with the term secession? Talks about how you can like cut down a forest and over time it grows back, starting with some pioneer species and then and then more species that actually germinate in the shade and persist on the landscape for a very long time. And it's undis undisturbed condition. Well we have secession in grasslands as well, and there's some species of grasses and flowers that only occur after the site has been disturbed through grazing or fire. And uh, uh, those sorts of grasslands are probably actually the rarest we have. Uh, because nowadays when we disturb an area, it, it comes back as non-native species. And uh, so when you when you look at a lot of historic descriptions of Texas's coastal prairie, you'll see mentions of, of uh, I'm going to give you common names, uh, needle grass and uh, uh, three on, uh, side oats grama, which is the Texas state grass. Very, fairly short grasses that occur in these tall grass prairies, and they exist in this transitional environment after a prairie has been disturbed. Um, those used to be very common species because, uh, oh, when these botanists first started describing the prairie in the 1900s, those were dominant because so much of the area had been heavily grazed. Nowadays, when you look at disturbed areas of grassland, it's just all uh, species of grasses from Africa, Australia, Asia, India, uh, things like uh, King Ranch blue stem um, and, and other non-native grasses. I, I don't know, maybe I'm just being naive here, but okay, so are grasslands kind of like a uh, perpetual early successional stage that's maintained by the conditions that are there? Or? You could look at it as that. It's often described as a pyrrhic climax, meaning a it's a it's a climax, it's the final <coughs> stage of secession it is a grassland, but it's still maintained by fire. Um, there are grasslands that you could just put a fence around and walk away from in a thousand years they would still look the same. These are areas that occur on um, rocky soils or very deep sands. 
Uh, but the bottom line is you can't really separate grasslands from their disturbance agents like fire, but you know, is, there really is no climatic condition at which lightning would be absent from the Gulf Coast. So uh, that's a discussion that folks have had for a long time. Uh, but the bottom line is that it, it appears that these grasslands in our area and throughout the southeast have, have been around for many millions of years. So we should not really consider them as transitional communities. Did that answer your question? So uh, fire is, of course, always been present. It's not human dependent. Um, although people certainly do start a lot of fires, uh, but fire, you get, you've got to realize that we don't let fires burn now. Like Mark was saying, they could have burned for weeks and months at a time, crossing rivers even during dry climatic periods. And remember, a fire, like in 2011, that occurred. Have any of y'all seen Bastrop State Park after mm -hmm. it burned? So you saw what was left, right? Mm -hmm. So that sort of a fire occurring during a drought year, a 50-year drought, worst drought we had since the 1950s, occurring in the hot time of the year, occurring when it's not been raining, a fire like that could have covered a good portion of what we consider the Texas coastal prairie and left it in that sort of condition where you have sand blowing around and almost looks like a desert. That would set back forest for a century, if not more. So you've got to remember that it's not just these little fires that we like nowadays that, that used to maintain the prairie, but it was stuff that you know would almost be unimaginable on a, a, a scale that's almost unimaginable today. But we can't really do that. Obviously, we can't do that anymore. So we do what we can do. Which is we light our fires usually during the winter. Um, even though most natural prairie fires in this area occurred in this warm season, when I, I do keep a record of uh, wildfires caused by lightning, and most of them occur in May, June, July, and August, which a lot of it seemed in, on the coast of Texas to occur in May and June because we get these so when we first get these little pop up thunderheads that come off the gulf and as they first cross the land they don't start dropping any rain they're shooting lightning down but they don't really let any rain out until they hit the um, uh, sea breeze the sea breeze front meets uh, uh, air coming down from up north usually around hobby airport and then it'll start raining but you have a, a big area that's throwing lightning but no rain at all and there's more than enough dead material to, to let the prairie burn. We don't burn that time of the year because if we lit a fire up in June, it'd be a very slow creeping fire. We'd be burning a lot of green grass. It makes a lot of smoke and we would get in really big trouble for making smoke. So <coughs> our fires in the winter time, they burn. In the winter, you're burning dead vegetation. It's quick, it's hot, produces very little smoke. What's the long-term of that going to be? Well, I do know the Nature Conservancy and some other preserves that are further away from uh, humanity and their private group and they don't get as much grief as the state's public employee would. They've been switching to a lot of burns in April and May and uh, the result is they're getting a lot more flowers versus grasses um, following their burns. So probably one of the results of our management actions is we're losing um, that flower component or grasses, grass But again, as Mark showed, when you burn an area, it's not long before it looks beautiful green. You notice all the dead sticks, all the brush we burned up. The brush comes back. You see some re-sprouts here from the roots of the brush. Uh, but you burn it about every three years. On the fires, not only do you have to decide which way you want the, creep, the, the, the fire to creep, but you also have to think about the direction of that smoke. Is that that, the only thing we think about is smoke. Okay. But not about the direction that you want the fire to creep. So you'll we, we don't care if it can creep either way, but it's all about the smoke. Smoke management is our only concern. We're not worried about the fire escaping. It does sometimes, but... <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> 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 
I know. I mean, last time we burned at Brazos Bend, we burned four acres of our neighbor's pasture up. He was just like, well, just why'd you put it out? You know, because it makes such good grazing. Um, we just had to fix this fence. We didn't really care about it. But oh my gosh, we burned down at Galveston Island State Park. If we get one single call to Austin about the smoke, that's that's <coughs> the next three years, no fire. You know. Um, uh, people don't like uh, their, their living room to smell like a bacon bit. So, again, I want to just talk about in our, if you look at um, the geologic map of Texas, and uh, right here is the Balcones Escarpment. And what you've had is uh, these different colors represent different rock units. Um, this is about 2,000 feet in elevation here, the Texas High Plains. This is essentially the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. So as the Rocky Mountains have emerged um, and lifted the land up, uh, this part of the state got really high, and so you have rivers running down to the coast, and those rivers are running through uh, on a, in a steep rocky channel, and they're eroding through uh, a lot of sediment, and they're carrying all that sediment down into the Gulf of Mexico in over millions of years, 40, 50 million years. We've had all of these layers of sediment laid down as that river-borne sediment came out into the Gulf and is starting to build the land out into the Gulf of Mexico. All that river-borne sediment is slowly filling up the Gulf. And uh, each successive geologic epoch has been putting down uh, more and more sediment, and sediments of different characteristics, and so you get these parallel bands of different kinds of, uh, of rock being laid, rock being formed, which then form different sorts of soils. And if you look at the ecosystems, of, this is the ecosystems of Texas map, you can see that the different ecosystems follow the state's geology. And that's because a lot of these ecosystems are really there because of the soils that are there. So it's not just climate, in fact, it's more so than climate, it's it's the um, geologic history of the state that results in our different um, in the state's different ecosystems, and grasslands are not an exception to that. <coughs> this I just like to show this. It's a it's out of date, but it was a, it's a map of the vegetation that <coughs> as it existed in 1984. And you see this brown is all agriculture and uh, where the grasslands were is for the most part all agriculture now and even up here in east texas it looks wooded as you drive on 59 you just think it's just one big forest but if you look carefully about 100 feet you see that it's there's no forest back there it's either pasture or it's um, pine plantation which is maybe a 20 or 30 year old pine tree at the most really not much different than a cornfield. Uh, so most of the state's native vegetation is long gone, at least in the eastern half of the state. Um, an exception is the post oak savanna we have here uh, because it's very poor for farming. <coughs> This is a close-up of uh, the topography of the Texas coast. Here's Galveston Bay. And when I, you can see how dissected the land is up here. There is grassland here, post oak savanna, but it's much more covered in trees than the coast is itself. And one of the big reasons is that you see how dissected the landscape is. All of these myriad of little creeks and valleys act as fire breaks, whereas the coastal plain itself is extremely flat. It's all this same color denoting it's all the same elevation. Um, it's very, very flat, and so uh, fires could run across that land very easily. And also what you can notice is that here's the Brazos River Valley. As it comes out of this high ground and hits the coast, you'll notice all of this, the topography of the coastland, coastline is essentially one big river delta where the river has changed its course over the years and built this land up and you can see all these little protrusions, little fingers that stick out into our embayments 
those are areas where the river at one time or another brought sediment down to, to build up the land. And uh, this is an explanation by geologists of how this coastal plain was, was uh, built up. So this is the coastal plain, not just a, around the Houston area. I want to be clear that what I'm going to describe here, this is how the Gulf Coast was constructed. So we're talking about Mexico, we're talking about all of Texas, Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, uh, even the same holds true for the coast of Georgia, the Carolinas. All of it essentially is uh, where rivers are coming down out, down out of high ground, they're bringing sediment down to the ocean and they're building up a flat plain along the ocean's edge, typically called a coastal plain. And really, it's nothing more than a series of overlapping river deltas, not a delta that builds out into the water like the Mississippi Birdfoot Delta, but rather as the rivers come out of the high ground and they hit this low flat area, the river slows down. It can no longer carry all of the heavy sediment, the gravel, the sand, the clays. It can no longer carry that sediment because the water is not moving very fast. The water is slowed down because the slope of the land is so much less. So the sediment builds up in the channel and the channel uh, is not competent to carry the water anymore and then you get a flood and it washes that sediment out of the channel and it's that deposition of the sediment adjacent to this river channel as it hits the coast that builds up the land. So the delta is really forming inland of the water just inland of the water. <clears throat> so they call it a fluvial delta, which is just a moving water delta. It's not a it's not actually deposition out in the out in the bay or out in the Gulf. It's for the most part responsible for building up this coastal plain. Uh, so if you look at Texas, here's Corpus, we have the Nueces, the San Antonio, Guadalupe, Colorado, Brazos, Trinity, Sabine River, all of these rivers have these deltas associated with them. And it's that deltaic history, that geologic history, that really gives us uh, the fine-grained differentiation in plant communities that make up our coastal prairie. Uh, here's an example from the Colorado River. Uh, the way this worked is the river came down towards the Gulf, comes out of the high ground, it spreads out during floods, builds up a big uh, delta lobe inland of the Gulf, we have an ice age. Sea level in the Gulf of Mexico drops about 400 feet. Suddenly you got 400 feet of drop between here and here. What does the river do? It speeds up. It becomes competent to carry gravel, sands, all that. It cuts a deep, deep valley down through its old delta lobe and starts putting sediment out here. Ice age doesn't last that long. Um, we have a warm period. The ice melts. The ocean fills up again. And as the ocean fills up, this river suddenly no longer has enough drop to carry its sediment. You know, there's only about 40 feet of elevation difference between here and here, over maybe 100 miles. So once again, the river starts overflowing its banks and pushing sand and gravel and clay over the sides of its banks. It builds up another lobe. We have another ice age. The river goes down. Ice age ends. The river's in a different position. It builds up another lobe. So if you look, we've got one, two, three, four different ice age periods represented in this Colorado River Delta. Well, we've had about 40 or so ice ages since the beginning of the Pleistocene. And uh, so this happened over and over and over again. You got over 100 miles width here. And that's how the Texas coast was really all the Gulf and Atlantic coasts were created. And uh, if you look at this as an old Apollo photo, I use this photo because it was taken at a time when rice agriculture was dominant. And uh, the rice farmers, they're farming that delta lobe of the Brazos River. So you can see this really does look like a perfect river delta right here. This is the Brazos Colorado River Delta. Here's Houston. Um, well over 100 miles in width and 100 miles in depth. So we're talking a very large area, and um, it truly is a, a delta plain. Here's a Google Earth shot. Uh, here's Houston. 
here's the Brazos River coming down. All of these old bayou channels, Green's Bayou, Buffalo Bayou, Gray, Sims Bayou, Chocolate Bayou, all of these old bayou channels, Mustang, those are old channels of the Brazos River. So each time we have an ice age, the river would cut down through the sediments. It would dig a channel, the ice age would end, the water would rise back up. Uh, the river would fill its channel very quickly and then uh, would switch, create a whole new channel, the process starts over and over again and eventually this, if you could speed up this, do like a time lapse photography of the Brazos River Delta here over say a million years, the river would just look like it was just like staking back and forth across the land as time went on, building all of this up. And I got these elevations in here, 150 feet, that's where it's coming out of the high ground. If this is around uh, the Cinco Ranch, 56 feet in elevation, Sienna Plantation. If you look at the elevation about 20 miles to the east, it's actually lower than what the river is. So when the river is running high, the water level in the river is actually above the level of the city of Houston and these areas to the east. So the river really is ready to switch channels again. Yeah. Hey, avulsion, what does that mean? Avulsion is where you have a, the river switches its channel all at once, like during a single storm event. Um, so at some point it wants to switch back towards Chocolate Bayou um, area. Uh, it's gonna take a long time for that to happen because uh, of all the dams upstream on the Brazos and the Colorado River, uh, geologists, their best estimate is that the Brazos River only carries 10% of the sediment that it once carried. Most all of it's being trapped in <coughs> Possum Kingdom, and Lake Whitney, Aquila, places like that. Um, so it's, it's, you know, you think we had a big flood with Harvey? That was nothing at all. Nothing compared to historic floods. If we didn't have those reservoirs up there, Brazos was capable of carrying about 400 highest recorded flood is 450,000 cubic feet, about three times what was flowing during Harvey. So imagine three times more water. And during Harvey, this was one sheet of water from the Colorado River to the San Bernard to the Brazos River. It was all one single sheet of water. Mm -hmm. So imagine three times that. <clears throat> Here's Jaime's map that I stole as well. <laughs> <laughs> that shows the coastal prairie in uh, Louisiana and Texas. Now there are other grasslands, but this is strictly the range of the coastal prairie. So up here you've got pine savannas, you've got pine savannas over here to the east as well. Uh, you've got post oak savanna, blackland prairie, but the coastal prairie is right there. Um, one thing that's different about the coastal prairie than other prairies is that it's very wet and it's very warm. And so we have a lot of what are called tropical grasses, um, grasses especially in the genus Paspalum uh, that you won't see in, in other prairies. And again, this is all built up on clay soils, um, soil eroded by the Brazos and Colorado River in really dry areas, uh, Permian red beds, places like that. That's why the Brazos is red. It's eroding away a lot of the sediments from the Permian red beds around Midland, Odessa, that sort of area. And uh, when it dries out, you have these big cracks. Uh, it's called a vertisol because uh, dirt, when it rains again, dirt runs down these cracks and fills them up and then they shrink shut. But you've got extra dirt, so it gets pushed out sideways and eventually you get a series of mounds and dips, mounds and dips formed. Uh, by this vertical mixing action of the soil. and uh, It's called the Gilgai relief. It just looks like little 10, 15 foot uh, rectang rectangular divots in the ground. Um, <coughs> that's a natural landscape. And it's something that trees really don't like. Uh, if you were to cut through the soil, this is what it looks like. You have black and then red, black and red. And this is where you have a crack and organic matter and soil is going down into that crack and it gets trapped down there when the soil gets wet and seals back shut and it pushes outwards and as it pushes it hits the next you've got a crack here pushing this way a crack here and the soil is pushing this way it pushes together and it 
cruises the soil between up into a, a mound, a chimney. Uh, trees do not like that. These are some black and white photos, uh, actually, of the Armored Bayou Nature <coughs> Center in the region. Um, and uh, I have to use these old black and white photos because this landscape is gone now, for the most part. So you're looking at uh, fossil landscapes here. Uh, these are from the 1930s. And um, <coughs> what you've got, so this is essentially the region that's now Clear Lake. Um, so I told you this is all a, a deltaic creation. It's created by the Brazos River. It's essentially a portion of its delta. And this dark areas are wetter, the lighter colored or drier areas. And what you can see on this is uh, all these old dark things that look like channels. Those are, those are old river channels. And um, it was the overbank flooding of those ancient channels of the Brazos, the overbank flooding that pushed um, sand up outside of the channel. You know, you, you look at a river, you've got sandbars, you've got sandy banks along the river. That's what you're seeing here is high, dry, sandy ground. So the soil here would be fairly sandy on the surface. And it's going to be about 5 or even 10 feet above the elevation of the old river channel, which is going to be filled with clay. Where is that, Andy? Um, I can't find a single point of reference. I think my house is <laughs> right here. <laughs> so, uh, this is uh, Horse Pen Bayou. Okay. And Armored Bayou is right over here, and this is the old, uh, this is where the uh, path <coughs> I don't know who runs the gas. Yeah, Tejas Gas. Yeah, yeah, it's right over yeah. here. Right? Okay. So this would be uh, NASA down here. This is Northwest Houston. This is Cypress Creek. Okay. And <coughs> so even on the north side of Houston, it was all part of this deltaic plain. And I want you to notice a couple features on here. One, you've got all these circular ponds. Some of them, like this one, that's probably a good 10 acres in size. Then you have all these little white dots everywhere. So this was not a flat completely flat landscape. It probably had a good 10 feet of local topography here, which is actually a hell of a lot. Uh, you had zillions of these ponds, zillions of these little white dots, which actually are little, what are called Mima mounds, or little sand dunes, or areas that are maybe a foot and a half in height, and they're essentially pure sand, and maybe 30, 60 feet in diameter. Uh, and then you have these what are called potholes or wetlands, sunbeam sun ponds. They're maybe a foot in depth, maybe two feet in depth, anywhere from a quarter acre to maybe 10 acres in size. And all of these features were part of this deltaic landscape. Is, is the landscape aged? It was eroded by water and by wind. Um, wind likes to create sand dunes, wind likes to create nice round ponds, the wind would work on these old river channels which are low and wet and filled with clay. Um, when they get wet, especially during this time of the year, the winter, uh, those very small clay particles get washed off the landscape. Uh, essentially what you're looking at here, as you can see, it's all draining down in this direction. It's almost like this, imagine this land is just like a sugar cube and you're dropping water on it and it's becoming pitted and eroded, washed away, melted away. That's what's occurring. The clays are washing and melting away and running down off into the bay. The sands are left behind and the wind blows them up into these dunal formations and is blowing out what used to be a long, sinuous wet wetland, maybe 500 feet in width is typical, is becoming just a series of wind deflated circular ponds. So you had a, as time worked on this landscape, you end up with big low flat areas, which were typically wet prairies, switchgrass, grass, areas filled with little sandy mounds and uh, innumerable ponds would be 
things like uh, Indian grass and big blue stem and little blue stem prairie, along with all sorts of marsh vegetation. And again, the forests were restricted to uh, edges of creeks for a couple reasons. One, uh, because the creek is a fire break, so you get a fire shadow along the creek, but also along the creek is typically sandy deposits, either from overbank flooding of that creek, or a lot of times these creeks, the modern creeks usurp, or they form within the old channels of the, the old abandoned Brazos, Colorado, whatever river channel. And so those channels have sandy deposits next to them. The trees do really well in that sand because it's a very permeable thing. It's, water can soak into it and it holds water. Trees can grow in it. Uh, so you would get a lot of forest, riparian forest. Uh, other than that, it was pretty much a wide open landscape. Here's some photos that you can see in the spring, winter and spring, the clay portion of the soil separates from the sands because of <coughs> chemical, biologically driven chemical reactions in the soil. And you get this, it looks like muddy water here. The clays actually form a colloid, meaning they get suspended in the water because of the, uh, the electrical charge on the outside of the clay particle and the charge of the water molecule itself. The clays become suspended. They will not settle out under those conditions. And so when it rains and water runs off the land, the clay runs off with them. You can see it's almost like this, the soil is just melting away. The surface of the land is melting away. And in fact, um, typical ice age cycle, say the geologists estimate we'd lose about 20 feet of soil over 100,000 years up on the Katy Prairie. So uh, <clears throat> a lot of erosion occurs. And it forms this really neat landscape where here's a, a topographic map. Purple is lower, darker the green, the higher the land. And you can see here is an old channel of the Brazos River snaking across the land. And on the what were the sandy banks, you've got these areas where the sand is being uh, piled up even more. Um, so you have nice, deep, relatively dry, sandy soils next to really low, wet areas. These, some of you may be able to see these little green dots. Those are meta mounds. This is what the landscape looks like in the black and white photograph. This is the Nash Prairie. This is uh, managed by the Nature Conservancy. This still exists. Yay. That's a 1995 photo. Uh, this is what it looks like on the ground. You have these areas when they dry out, the marsh dries out, the sand blows off to the adjacent ground to get a dune forming you get trees along that. So this is down south, uh, Lavaca Bay, Powderhorn Ranch, which is a new wildlife management area. Uh, and you, because it's a drier climate, you still have these ponds and dunes are still in their formative processes. Whereas in our area, um, it's pretty much static. Uh, it's wet and the ground is very well covered with vegetation, so we don't have this erosive stuff occurring very much anymore. Those occurred during drier climactic periods. <coughs> yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to dwell too much on this, but I just really want to point out how much of this prairie landscape was dominated by wetlands, by marshes. So we have whole. There's whole worlds. So I, I told you at the beginning that it's hard for me. I'm a biologist, and I actually learn a lot more than I'd like to admit. I learn by just looking at things, by visually looking at something, and then. It makes sense to me, um, not by reading about it in a book or by conducting a study. You know, what kills me is you have a university professor and he's studying various things, and I want to shake him and say, you're, it's no importance what you're studying, but that person doesn't know what he should study because he has no innate feel for what makes the land work, what maintained it. Um, it's almost like they're just blindly going at it. Well, it's because that person has never seen an intact prairie ecosystem in their life. And I don't know that very many people coming after me will be able to see that. But I know myself, I'm never going to be able to understand the Katy Prairie all that well because it's gone. For the most part, it's gone now. 
and I'm, I can never get that visual input, that visual understanding of how it used to be. I spend a lot of time looking at these old photos and uh, I dream about walking across, I actually have dreams about walking across this landscape and sometimes I get some insight or some understanding if this comes to me and I realize how stupid I've been, you know, for the last 10 years not to realize that before that point in time. And I just wonder how much is out there that I don't understand and will never understand. And I talk to these old timers, Charles Stutzen Baker, folks like that who grew up on the Katy Prairie before rice farming in the 30, 1930s, 1940s. They always <coughs> tell me, Andy, when I was a kid, prairie chickens and model ducks were all ass to elbows, you know? <laughs> model ducks in the potholes, prairie chickens on the prairie, well they're both extinct essentially. I mean prairie chickens, if it weren't for birds, the graders are bringing down from Missouri, they're, they're essentially extinct. And model ducks are really not far behind. There's still plenty on the Mississippi Delta, but nobody should be shooting model ducks in Texas. They're for the most part gone. They don't occur in any of our state parks anymore. They used to occur in a lot of them. Well, sea rim they still are. <clears throat> All right, I'll quit lecturing y'all. Again, a coastal uh, close up of the coastal prairie in Texas, and what you see is that the prairie dominates these old Pleistocene landscapes. The Holocene or the modern flood floodways are dominated by forest. So you have the Colorado, the San Bernard, the, Co the Brazos, San Jacinto, the Trinity River, or forest, and everything in between is grass grasslands, and that's the case. You can extend this map all the way along the Gulf Coast and up the Atlantic Coast. That's the way it is. Um, and again, this is Brazos Bend, the one park that does have great examples of relatively pristine landscapes. So here's the wet uh, clay, clay-y portion of the prairie. Here's dry upland sand. So between here and here is about five feet in elevation with the drastic change in soil type. And, uh, you see the trees are growing on these nice sandy loam soils. Uh, pioneers would describe this as a sea of grass with islands of trees. And those trees weren't growing just randomly, they were growing in areas where you had the right soil for the, them to exist, which are the result of the geologic history of the coastal plain. Yeah, I'm just gonna show you some pretty pictures, because I never have enough pretty pictures. <laughs> You see the Chinese collar. <coughs> this is a heavily grazed area. And as long as they keep the cattle on here, the, the collar is restricted to the wetlands. Um, they keep it out of the high ground, which is, again, you do get a lot of forbs that, especially annual flowers, that need this intense grazing to continue. But if they were ever to take that those cattle off, because the main prairie, the main grass matrix is gone, all those ice cream plants are gone, it would immediately become brush and trees. In about three years time, it would just look like a, a forest. Uh, these are the Mima Mounds. See, these are sand dunes. Those are relics of a dry climactic period about 8,000 years ago, uh, when we had hotter and drier summers and actually colder, wetter winters. Uh, global average temperature is less than it is today, but the summer temperature was higher than it is. Um, and so you had a lot of stuff going around here in those dry periods. And there's lots of very rare plants that occur on the edges of these dunes. The rain hits the sand, soaks in, hits the clay that the dune is built on, it weeps out the side, and as it weeps out, it, it evaporates and you get uh, soil that's very high in calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium, various salts, so you have a ring of salt, and within that ring of salt, it's really hard for plants to grow, but you've got a few that have evolved to uh, those conditions and they're uh, endangered for the most part. Prairie dawn, windmill grass, uh, stuff like that. Sundews, a little carnivorous plant that eats ants. Uh, funky Indian blanket. Uh, other stuff in there. Here's that salt ring I was telling you about. See that white bear, that white bear condition, that's the natural condition of that. This tall grass prairie with tall in the background. Y'all know that? Super common. 
Right after a burn, you get a lot of things like Texas coat flax, Coreopsis. That's right after a, a, a good burn. And again, this is neat because it's a glass lizard. It's not a snake. That's a lizard that burrows through the sand. So it's living in those Mima mounds right adjacent to the, to the wetlands. People typically associate glass li lizard with arid or even desert environments. Where did you take that, the glass lizard? Grass Bend State Park. Mm. I've seen them in Galveston, though, as well. Uh, Y'all see the deer, right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> this is at Sheldon Lake State Park, and I wanted to show this because we removed the tallow. We chipped the tallow, similar to like what Mark did, but we left the native trees, and you can see that you, frequently on the prairie you had mixes of trees and wetlands and grasses. Really neat environment. And again, our grassland birds are very quickly declining because of the lack of, of grassland. And yes, you had things like beavers that probably were important in keeping weeds in check. And of course, fire is extremely important. <coughs> this is Galveston Island State Park after we burned. It's just showing the beginning of the end of the uh, the Katy Prairie, all these lines are ditches that ranchers are putting in to drain those uh, ponds. And of course, now the major loss of grassland is to home development. Again, Sheldon Lake State Park, it is possible to restore these areas. Uh, San Jacinto Monument, that's all been planted. Um, and just some other grassland environments outside of the um, coastal prairie. If you go to the north, all through East Texas, we have pine oak savanna. Um, these are some examples of sandstone barrens and then deep, very deep sands of Sparta sands, uh, where you have some really neat grassland communities. Um, this is the post oak forest I was telling you about. This is sand post oak this is on Fort Boggy State Park. So you see the little blue stem underneath. Mm -hmm. We've since ran a very hot fire and actually removed a good part of that overstory just through the fire. And um, the grasses have greatly increased. When did you run Great. that? Go ahead. I'm sorry. When did you run that? When? When did you run that fire? Yeah, I noticed that there was some fire going through there. I think I, I, think I was last there maybe 2005, 2006. Yeah, we, that hot fire was, uh, I want to say, 2013. Okay. Mark, is that does Boggy Creek flow through that state yes. park? Yeah. Did you ever see the movie The Legend of Boggy Creek? No, is there a chainsaw involved? <laughs> 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 it's like that. Yeah, it's a Bigfoot thing. That's just me. This, this is down at Davis Hill. So you, Davis Hill, you have the <coughs> Bald Cypress Swamp, and then you go up on top of the Salt Dome, you climb through these little sandstone canyons, and you come up to this beautiful grassland on the top. It's gorgeous, and we have things like leaf cutter ants that live in deep sands. And again, people don't think of our coastal marsh as a grassland, but it is. Um, and it's really the biggest chunk of remaining grassland we have. This is the Brazoria National Wildlife Refuge, which will grade from uh, wet, <laughs> wet marsh areas that are subject to high tides. Um, into tall grass prairie, little blue stem dominated prairie. So you see the different, this is the wet pothole formation, the little round pond right here, and then here's the upland sandy prairie next to it. And it's gorgeous, you can get out there and you can't see the horizon, I love it. There's no nothing on the horizon that looks created by a human being. It's about 60,000 acres, I think. So it's a, it's a true, uh, a jewel. Some of our barrier islands are still undeveloped. This is Matagorda Island. That's the lighthouse there. Again, these are grassland dominated as well. This is um, wild indigo, false indigo on, at the Galveston Island State Park. So, again, you have these round ponds forming in those dunes there as well and the sands there. <coughs> and we're doing a, most of the tall grasses were grazed out at the park and so we're reintroducing them. That's working quite well. And you can see when you burn, not everything gets burned up. What you're doing is you're maintaining a mosaic of woody and grassland species. You're not killing all the 
all the woodies. This is an area next to a pond, and the pond acted as a fire break, so all of them. This is um, wax myrtle survive, and that's important because a lot of birds need that component as 